My name is Sabelle Shattuck, and I teach at Western Michigan University, where I do research that actually looks at the intersection of religion and ecology. For a number of years now, I have been part of a local group here in Kalamazoo, Michigan, called Hope for Creation, where people of faith who have a deep conviction that our faith traditions call us to care for this beautiful planet home that we live on, where we work together to try to take action in our personal lives, in our congregational lives, and to promote action in our community. Today, I'm going to be talking about the creation of green teams and what motivates people to start such groups in their congregations, because this is something that we find gives great meaning to our lives here in our community. And we know that there are many people who would also like to be doing this kind of work. And um, we'd like to connect with them and share our experiences. All over the country, there are people who are involved in doing faith-based earth care. Back in 1992, in the lead up to the Rio summit, an organization called the Natural Religious Partnership, National Religious Partnership for the Environment um, emerged. And this was actually a collaboration brought together by Jews and Christians. And that Christian umbrella was large. It included Eastern Orthodox, it included Catholics, it included liberal evangelicals and, and Protestants and also more conservative evangelicals. And they started keeping track of the work that people of faith were doing around the country. Um, and one of my favorite websites that they used to have included this map showing all these different congregations around the United States where churches and synagogues and temples and Sikh gurdwaras and mosques were engaged in doing environmental work. People around the country were doing things like putting solar panels on their churches because if you want to reduce your carbon footprint, you have to change the kind of energy that you're uh, using. They were marching in and rallying for environmental justice issues, whether that was climate change or issues like access to clean water and clean food. In Detroit, near where I am here in Kalamazoo, Michigan, many churches developed community gardens as a way to promote food security in neighborhoods where they didn't actually have a lot of fresh produce in their grocery stores. And churches like the Church of the Messiah in Detroit actually became an, uh, a business incubator where people who wanted to develop food-based businesses could use the church kitchen in order to create their products. So there's this creative outpouring of work going on all around the country that people in faith were engaged in. So today, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what people of faith are doing, but more about why they're doing this kind of work. What are some of the deep distresses of our earth home that people of faith are responding to? And why do they feel that as people of faith, they have a moral obligation to do this kind of work? People I spoke to in these congregations all said, that when you start a green team, one of the most important things to do is to take time to think about why you're doing this through a faith community. You can do environmental work in a lot of different areas. You can join the Sierra Club. You can join the Citizens Climate Lobby. You can support earth justice. You can support the Nature Conservancy. There are lots of ways to do environmental work. So why are there some people who think they need to do this through their faith communities? in the context of a congregation. That's what I'd like to talk about today. I'll start with a story that illustrates what people of faith described to me when I went out to talk to them about the work they were doing. Trinity Presbyterian Church in Virginia started its green team all the way back in 1996, one of the longest running programs I've encountered. And back then, a number of members in the church who, who felt that the church needed to be active in dealing with environmental issues, they formed a small group called an Earth Care House Church. 
Now, House Church is actually a subsidiary um, group within the church that essentially does all the same things as the larger church. They worship together, they have fellowship together, but they also do ministry work that is particular to their topic. And the way a house church works is that if an individual within the congregation sees a ministry need, they reach out to other members of the larger church community and say, hey, I think this needs to be addressed. What do you think? And if other people share their interest, share their concern, then they put together a covenant describing what the mission of their house church will be. For this house church, their mission was to restore creation. And they would do that through personal actions undertaken at the church and in the community, and also through doing education within their congregation and within the wider community. So they engaged in actions like developing a produce garden and taking the produce to a food pantry. They would uh, take children from urban areas on outings to connect them to nature and give them an experience of the natural world. One of their projects was to weatherize the church so it would lose, use less energy because the church is actually in an old building that wasn't very energy efficient. As part of this process of being a house church, they had to do study in order to better understand how their faith tradition connected to the environmental issues that concerned them. So they spent time reading Presbyterian texts about restoring creation and social justice, the works of theologians, and also about other congregations doing work in the country. And Lynn Cameron, whom I interviewed, said one of the things that happened is the more they read, the more they felt reading wasn't enough, they needed to take action. But she also said it was important to do the theological study first. Once the theology was within us, we could act out our faith. And she said, one of the reasons this mattered was because Virginia is a Southern state. And it was not uncommon for them to encounter people who would say, why are you doing environmental stuff? Environmentalism isn't a Christian thing. And in that context, it was very important to be able to say, yes, it is. And to be able to cite chapter and verse of the scriptures to talk about why their Christian values were actually the basis for the environmental work that they were doing. This idea of studying and coming to understand the basis of what's driving your actions is important for this kind of work to be successful. Now, one of the problems that came up that became central to the work that they did was discovering how bad the air pollution in nearby Shenandoah National Park was. This was a place where they would go hiking and they would take young members of the church on outings, but Shenandoah National Park was suffering from damage caused by acid rain. And when members of the Earth Care House Church explored the causes of this pollution, they realized it was produced by coal burning power plants, but those power plants weren't even in Virginia, they were in West Virginia. Because in the United States, the prevailing winds cross our country from west to east, and they carry the pollution across the state boundaries because air pollution doesn't know where the state begins and ends. They also did further research to learn more about the coal power that was polluting their beloved Shenandoah National Park. And they learned about mountaintop removal mining. When we think about coal mining, we usually think about the coal miner with the helmet that's got the light on the front going down into the deep dark mine shaft and the idea that the coal gets put in these little railroad cars and taken out to uh, a lift and lifted up to the surface yards and yards, feet and feet above where the, the tunnels of the mines are. But that's not actually the way much mining is done anymore. The coal seams in the Appalachian Mountains are consistently 500 feet below the peaks of the mountains. It's about the geological layering of this mountain range. And the coal companies have figured out that it's cheaper and faster to just rip the entire top off the mountain and dump all that overburden, that waste, into the valley. So you can see in this photo in the background, there are flat areas that used to be mountaintops. 
This type of mining actually isn't very good for employment because you don't need many people, just a few people to handle really big equipment. And in the process, you not only destroy the mountain, you destroy the valley, you destroy the ecosystems of the valley, you plug up and contaminate the streams flowing through the valley. And those streams, of course, are the water supplies for people's homes, they're the streams that children play in, they're streams where people go fishing. Members of the Earth Care House Church, as they learned more about this, they did have compassion for people who worked in the coal industry. Some of them even had relatives in that business, but they felt that this was a desecration of God's beautiful mountains. And they also realized the problem was enormous because this wasn't something that just had to do with Virginia policy. This was national energy policy they were dealing with and it couldn't be solved locally. So they were feeling a little powerless. They were recognizing that, as one person said, we're just this little group of 12 people over here in Virginia. What can we do about a national energy policy? But they were convinced God does not call us to do little things. Even if the task seems enormous, they had to try. And one of the things that helped them take action was a message their minister was fond of. Often the Reverend Ann Held would say, God calls you to be faithful, not successful. In other words, even if you don't know if you can make it happen, even if you don't know that the outcome will be as big or as perfect as you desire, you still have to try. The trying is valuable. The trying is how you live your faith. So with that in mind, they decided they had to try. Now the Reverend Ann Held also reminded them that they were not just a little group of 12 people in a house church in Virginia. They were part of a larger church, which was part of a denomination that included people in congregations all over the United States of America. And so she suggested that they actually try to address this issue by bringing it to all the Presbyterians in the United States. So they put together a resolution and they took it to the General Assembly meeting where representatives from churches all over the country would gather together. In that resolution, they said they wanted the Presbyterian Church USA denomination to send out information to all the congregations in the United States, explaining about the problem with coal plant pollution and how it was harming the health of ecosystems and humans. Here in the United States, one out of 11 children suffers from asthma. It is the single largest cause of absenteeism from our school systems. Here in Michigan, it's one out of six children of color because they live closer to our power plants and to other sources of pollution that contribute to the asthma epidemic that we have in this country. So they wanted to send out the word to educate people about why this was such a problem and why it needed to be addressed. They also wanted to ask the people in all those congregations be told how much they could help by urging their local government officials to enforce clean air laws, to end the grandfather exemptions that allow old super dirty coal plants to keep operating even though they don't meet current standards because they're not held to standards that were put in place after they were built. And also to enact new and better laws that would truly clean up our air. And they also wanted the Presbyterian Church to advocate in Washington, DC. Most of our religious organizations actually have lobbyists in Washington, DC. So they presented this resolution to the General Assembly and it passed unanimously. They were so excited. The work they had done had borne fruit. And in fact, it got media coverage and Southern Company, one of the large coal-based utility companies actually asked to meet with members of the house church in order to explain to them that they weren't that bad after all. Lynn Cameron told me she went to the library and she did research because she is a librarian and she came in able to cite peer reviewed studies about how Southern Company was actually doing a lot to harm people through air, air pollution. But she said what was most important was 
as a person of faith who believes that other people are moral human beings who will do the right thing when presented with the truth. What was most important to her was that the Southern Company people were willing to meet with them and sit in a room and listen to them and listen as they spoke truth to power. So this is an example of what can happen when a faith community actually is motivated by its environmental concerns and strengthened by its religious traditions in order to take action. I wanna take a moment to talk about some of the distresses in our environmental systems that motivate people of faith to take action like this. We have a world of limited resources. There are almost seven and a half billion people on the planet. So even actions that worked just fine 200 years ago, even 100 years ago, may be a problem now because there are a lot of us doing those actions. You think about deforestation and how the trees, which are so important for putting oxygen into our atmosphere and taking carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere, so many of them are being cut down in order to raise cattle so that we can have more hamburgers. Our urban sprawl that takes away the habitat for wildlife and also affects water systems and air systems and soil systems. Problems with access to fresh produce and food around the world. The oil system that damages the environment through the pumping process, through the pipeline leaks, and through the emissions that contribute to global warming. We get contamination of our air and water. Our spaces are being overrun with pavement and impervious surfaces and pollutants that run off into our ecosystem. And then of course, there's the threat of the sixth great extinction and the loss of animals with whom we share this wonderful planet. Think about a couple of these in a little more detail. Air pollution, the cause of that, much of the asthma that I was talking about, it also can damage wonderful pollinators. So there are actually places in China that there are no longer any bees to pollinate the orchard crops. And humans have to go out with little sponges and hand pollinate the flowers so that they can actually have tree fruits. It turns out human beings are not nearly as efficient at this, at this work as insects are. It's hard, sl slow work, and the trees don't bear nearly as much fruit after the humans do the work as they would after the bees do the work. Fresh water. We here in the Great Lakes have a tremendous responsibility. Our planet we see the big blue dot in space, or little blue dot as it were, and we say, look at all that water, but 90% of it is salty and we can't drink it. Of the 3%, a little less than 3% that's fresh water, most of it's locked up in glaciers and ice at the poles. So that just leaves a tiny amount of fresh water for us to actually use to drink and grow our crops. And of that precious fresh water, 21% of the world's fresh water is right here in the Great Lakes Basin. So when we talk about pure Michigan, we have such a responsibility to care for the ecosystem around us. Here in the United States, almost half of our rivers and streams, almost a third of our lakes are already polluted to the point where we can't really drink the water safely. That's not really a very good way to ensure the health and well being of the humans or the other creatures on our planet. And then, of course, there's the biodiversity loss. The forests rich in biodiversity that are being replaced with either cropland or animals that we like to eat. Same thing is happening in our oceans where we've overfished or we've damaged the coral reefs that are the nurseries and the homes of the animals that we'd like to go fishing for. Even our food crops, we've lost most of the biodiversity there as we've simplified our crop systems. And whenever you have highly simple systems, there are risks because an outbreak of a disease 
or an insect or a flood can mean destroying an entire crop and there's no resiliency if there's no diversity. Endangered species like the Carner's blue butterfly here in Michigan. But then there are the good news stories like the Kirtland's warbler which was endangered and now has actually been taken off the endangered species list that shows that humans can care for creation and do the right thing when we try hard enough. So here in Michigan, we actually have that as a success story to help motivate us. And of course, the big one, the one that hangs over all of us is climate change. We sometimes forget that the greenhouse effect is actually the basis of our planetary climate. It's actually a good thing, the greenhouse effect. The idea is that our atmosphere is composed of gases and, and they work like the glass of a greenhouse so that the light of the sun comes in through the atmosphere and it makes contact with the surface of the earth. It turns into heat and the heat and light are reflected much of it goes back through the atmosphere into outer space, but some of it stays. And because of that, we are here on this planet with all of these insects and plants and animals and birds and fish, because this planet is warm enough for us to live here. Without that atmosphere, we'd be as cold as the cold reaches of space. Unfortunately, because of all of the carbon dioxide and methane and greenhouse gases that humans have been putting into the atmosphere at a faster and faster rate over the last century, that atmosphere is getting thicker and it's getting harder for the sunlight to bounce back out into space. And that's why our planet is heating instead of staying in normal temperature ranges. And of course, as that happens, it's affecting all of the wildlife all of the ecosystems that we depend on. One of the places we see this change is in the plant hardiness zones, where you can see in 1990, Michigan was a zone five. It was colder, the smaller the number, the colder the region. Now we're a zone six, most of lower Michigan. And one of the ways we've actually seen this play out is that spring comes a little earlier and one example of that is that in Holland, Michigan, the Tulip Time Festival has actually had to be moved earlier by about two weeks because the flowers were blooming before the festival could actually take place. So there's evidence of climate change all around us. It's already happening. Things are already changing. The impacts of climate change in the Great Lakes will affect every aspect of our lives, our recreational systems, our food systems, our housing systems, our public health systems. You think about what we're experiencing with COVID-19. This is a preview of some of the problems we could have with other diseases becoming more widespread because disease bearing insects like mosquitoes will be moving further north and bringing us tropical diseases. Also, as our population expands into new areas, we encounter new diseases and we bring them into the human population as happened with COVID-19. So we have some challenges here. <laughs> the world is suffering because of human actions. Scientists like Dr. Speth have talked about the need for a cultural transformation to, to deal with this. Back in 2006, Dr. Speth was part of a conference organized by Harvard in which they brought evangelical community leaders together with climate scientists and the climate scientists described climate change and what was happening to the planet. And Dr. Speth, when he spoke, he talked about how the scientists needed the help of the faith community. And this particular quote has become quite famous because he talked about how he thought our big problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change, and those could be solved with good science. The science would explain what was happening and what needed to be done differently, and then the politicians would enact the policies and would fix it. But it didn't work that way. The 30 years have gone by, and things are getting worse instead of better. So he came to the conclusion that our real problems are social problems. They're moral problems. 
They're problems of selfishness, greed, and apathy, and science doesn't tell us how to solve that. So he asked the evangelical leaders if they could help because it's their job, their work, to focus on helping people live moral lives. So that has become a basis for thinking about what the faith community might actually have to contribute to responding to our great environmental distresses. Perhaps we have something special to bring to this. Perhaps we have a particular role to play that other people can't play very well. You think about the great social movements of the past, the abolition of slavery, the civil rights movement. Moral voices spoke up. They changed hearts and minds. They helped to change our social systems so that we could move towards greater equity and a better society. We need to do that again around climate change and our other environmental distresses. But it begs the question, how do our faith traditions call us to respond to the earth's distresses? The Reverend Jeff Wild, a Lutheran pastor from the Madison Christian community, he said, you know, we need, we know we need to care for the environment. We have to ask, why should we as people of faith have concern for the environment? Because he pointed out to me, if he can't ground this concern in theology, it doesn't really belong in his church. There are other places where you could do this action. If it's going to be done in church, in the mosque, in the synagogue, in the temple, in the gurdwara, then there has to be a reason that connects to the faith tradition because those are the spaces where we are talking about how to live our faith. Numerous faith leaders have said, yes, this connection exists. And they've called on members of their traditions to care for the earth. One such call came from the US Catholic bishops who talked about care for the earth and said, it's not just an Earth Day slogan, it's a requirement of our faith. We're called to protect people and the planet, living our faith in relationship with all of God's creation. Pope Francis has reiterated this message, as did both of the popes before him. Other faith traditions are also active in this work. The Coalition on the Environment and Jewish Life talks about how the Jewish tradition connects to care of the earth. The Evangelical Environmental Network spearheaded a What Would Jesus Drive campaign, asking evangelicals to think about how they could drive smaller, more fuel efficient cars instead of gas guzzling SUVs in order to protect God's creation. Within the United States, African Americans have started a green the church movement. It's been going on for about a decade now. And every couple of years they gather and, and share stories of what they're doing in their congregations in order to care for people and planet. Interfaith Power and Light provides resources to respond to global warming and encourages people of all faiths to put their faith into action, as does the National Council of Churches through its creation justice ministries. So all of these people are saying, yes, yes, we should be doing this. So I wanted to talk for a few minutes about some of the faith teachings that they're citing to explain why people of faith should be doing this. Religious stories from every tradition teach about how human behavior affects the natural world. We sometimes forget the story of Noah's Ark begins by talking about how human beings have made a mess of things and that's why God decides that he's going to cleanse the surface of his beautiful creation and let things start afresh. The Noah's Ark story is a wonderful story for the call to action because this is a story in which Noah is told, it's your job, oh human, it's your job to gather up all of the wonders of creation, all of the species that, that God has brought into existence that make this planet such a gorgeous place and take them to safety while this purification process is going on. It's a beautiful story about humans' responsibility to protect the rest of the biodiversity on our planet, all of the other beings with whom we share this wondrous space. 
there's certain themes that uh, are running through the teachings that, that people highlight about the human relationship to nature and what our faith traditions tell us about our role as caretakers of this planet. One that is very prevalent within the Abrahamic traditions is the idea that human beings are stewards who've been given a special role by God in which they have a responsibility to care for the rest of the planet as Noah cared for the other species. And so we see all the way back to the creation story in the Bible, this notion that when humans were created and put in the Garden of Eden, God put them there specifically to till it and keep it or to tend it and keep it. So this notion that human beings actually are supposed to look after the planet that is around them and live in a harmonious relationship with the rest of the planet. Garden of Eden has become a beautiful metaphor of what a balanced human relationship with nature might look like. Islam has the same teaching in the hadiths, the hadiths are the stories about the life of Muhammad and the other great teachers of Islam. It says that the world is beautiful and verdant and verily God be he exalted has made you his stewards in it. And he sees how you acquit yourselves. So there's this theme for green Muslims that talks about how humans are given this role of stewardship and that God is actually watching to see how well they fulfill that role. Conservative Christians also talk about the sense of being watched, that God is actually checking to see if people do these things right. Dr. Sleeth was a physician who worked in the emergency room and he would see all of the children coming in with the asthma attacks. And that was really the basis that inspired him to start really thinking about how human beings were relating to the creation around them. And as an evangelical, he said, you know, being pro stewardship is not a case of valuing forests more than people, which is sometimes the charge brought against environmentalists by people in a few religious traditions. They'll say, oh, you care more about spotted owls than you do about humans. You care more about polar bears than you do about humans. So here, the response to that is it's not about placing one over the other, it's about recognizing the world is God's world not human's world. And we're responsible to the creator for how we treat this creation. Throughout scriptures, one sees teachings that describe the responsibilities that human beings have, many of which talk about how to treat animals, how to treat ecosystems. One of my favorites comes from the Hindu tradition where it talks about the value of trees, in the Vishnu, the Hamalotras Purana, it says a single tree nurtures a man in the same way as a sun. What a sun would do is to gratify the gods through rituals. Sons in Hinduism are very, very important because sons are the ones who perform the funeral rituals that send their parents to heaven. So to compare anything to a son is saying they have a very high spiritual role. So here we see a tree is like a sun. It gratifies the gods with its flowers, just as the sun would do in the worship by making offerings of flowers. It gratifies travelers with its shade, offering hospitality, which is a very important social value. It gratifies men with its fruits. There's no fall into hell for the planter of the tree. There are several places in the Hindu scriptures where it talks about how people who plant and care for trees will never go to hell, particularly if they are mango trees. We see similar teachings in the biblical tradition where it talks about how people should care for their animals. The farm animals are supposed to get a day of rest on the Sabbath. It talks about how people should care for the land. The land itself is to be given a sabbatical every seven years and allowed to rest because the agricultural tradition of the Hebrew Bible stresses that human beings can only flourish when the land is healthy and thriving. And if the land is not cared for well, then human beings will suffer through drought, through famine and disease. So this notion that human beings have duties 
that there are proper ways to care for the land and the animals around us. We see this running through different religious traditions and their ethical teachings. Another theme that people of faith talk about when they're describing why they should engage in environmental action is that of social justice. There's this emphasis that environmental justice is social justice. The tradition of justice as cited in Micah that people are required to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God, or the teaching of Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself. These are foundations of justice teachings around the world. Now the Reverend Canon Sally Bingham in the Episcopal Church, who's the founder of Interfaith Power and Light, she says, you know, if you love your neighbor, you don't pollute your neighbor's air. We often, we don't think about how what we do in one place in the world affects people in other parts of the world. And yet, if we put pollution into the air in Michigan, it doesn't stay in Michigan. It travels across the border into Canada, across the border into Indiana, in fact, Southwest Michigan offers, often suffers from air pollution problems because of what happens in states to our Southwest, not because of what's going on here in Michigan. So when we think about social justice, we have to think about who's affected by our actions. Are we using up the climate in ways that cause other people to suffer? There's actually this new concept of climate refugees, people who are being driven from their homes because they can no longer survive on the land where they have lived for hundreds of years. The lands are dried out by the increased global heat so that the farms are no longer able to support human life. At the same time as some people are having to move because of heat and drought, other people are having to move because of flooding as sea levels rise and storms become more severe. And the irony is that the people who have to move are usually the people in low income countries that have not contributed to climate change. They have put the fewest greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. They have had the fewest benefits from our global fossil fuel based economy and yet they are suffering first and they're being hit the hardest. So the question has been raised by people at the Catholic Climate Covenant. Who is my neighbor in a climate challenged world? What does it mean to love my neighbor in a time of climate change when we know that what we do in one place is harming people that we've never met before? At the Jewish Reconstructionist Congregation in Illinois, Rabbi Rosen talks about how environmental action is really a continuation of the social justice work that his tradition of Reconstructionist Judaism has always done. This is not something new. This is just fulfilling the values we already practice. So he talks about how working in a soup kitchen, marching in a rally for immigrant rights, or building a new building in a green way is all part of the same ultimate sacred tradition. These are ways to practice tikkun olam, the healing of the world, which is the foundation of social justice work in the Jewish tradition. And because of that, this congregation raised extra money when they needed to rebuild their synagogue and replaced it with a building that is so energy efficient. It is a platinum LEED certified building. It was the first building, the first Jewish congregation in this country to achieve that level with a synagogue building. And they actually give green tours so that people can come and learn from them about how great a green building is. It's a lovely space, it's beautiful, it's comfortable, and the building itself is an expression of their religious values and how they live their values. A third theme that people talk about when they talk about why people of faith are called to care for the environment. Nature is a place of spiritual experience. The Psalms sing the glories of nature. And if we did not have these beautiful places, if we did not have forests and wildflowers and oceans, if we did not have birds and rainbows, how impoverished our spiritual lives would be. 
in the Bhagavad Gita, there's an entire chapter in which God is describing where people can find him. And he talks about the most powerful wind, the highest mountain, the most beautiful sights, how all of these are where you see divinity in the world around you, because those are the places that inspire awe and wonder. In the Jewish tradition, there's a, a practice of offering blessings when you see something truly wondrous or even something simple like the meal on your table, you should recite a blessing to remind you that these wondrous things come from the creation around us and from the creator, not from us. That human beings are but part of the system, not the powers who created the glories of nature. So when you see shooting stars or earthquakes or lightning or thunder or storms, awesome things, you should say praise to you whose strength and power filled the entire world. And when you see mountains, valleys, rivers, and wilderness, you should say praise to you who makes the works of creation because there's somebody else who created it, not us. These are reminders we're but part of the system and we would be impoverished without it. In Hinduism, the landscape is filled with expressions of divinity, often described as personified gods and goddesses. The great river Yamuna that flows from the Himalayas down to the ocean, that flows past the Taj Mahal, is a goddess, a goddess who purifies people and heals them and protects them from death. She's described as a beautiful goddess flowing through the forests, she dances with the birds and bees flying about her lotus fields, because of course the lotus blossoms bloom on the river. She completely destroys all disease, sickness, and sin for those who desire to bathe in her. May the daughter of the sun always purify me, says the person who goes to bathe in her waters. She's the daughter of the sun because her waters start in a glacier high in the Himalayas and the sun's rays come down and they strike that great ice field and they cause melt waters to then seep down and flow down the mountains, down to the valleys and all the way out to the sea. So a little geography, a little religion. We also see this sense of spirituality and, and connection to the earth and to nature as a place where we find solace. Anne Frank, whose life was of course terribly constrained, had a deep appreciation for the outdoors, particularly when she didn't get to go out very much during all those years of hiding in an attic. But she talked about how if you're afraid or lonely or unhappy, the best remedy is to go outside somewhere where you can be quiet, alone with the heavens, nature, and God. And how important that experience was to her, both as an actual experience and then as a memory to treasure during times when she could not do it herself. And even people who actually um, may not belong to a religious tradition or belong in God or believe in a God, will talk about how there's a spiritual experience in nature. Dr. Ursula Goodenough, a biologist and self-proclaimed atheist, calls herself a religious naturalist because she finds an experience that is just like religion that comes to her from the study of biology and understanding how cells work and how DNA and RNA function, how different species come into existence and evolve within their ecosystem niches. And she talks about this saying, this is how the religious naturalist thinks of our human advent on earth. We arrived but a moment ago and found it to be perfect for us in every way. And then we came to realize it is perfect because we arose from it and are part of it. This is our home, it's where we belong. Hosanna, not in the highest, but right here, right now, this. So even, even people who may not believe in one of the devotional religions can still have this sense of spiritual connection and morality in relation to the planet, can still believe in social justice, in stewardship, and in the spiritual experience of nature. 
Roger Gottlieb comments that as religious environmentalists, we want to save the world, but right now we do what we do because we wish to be the kind of person who lives like this, who honors God's creation, feels and responds to the sacredness of the earth and tries to love all of our neighbors as ourselves. Even if we don't know if we can make the big things happen, we want to be the kind of people who live this way, in right relationship with the earth, in right relationship with other human beings and with the other species with whom we share this planet. When I ask people of faith who are on green teams and doing this work in their congregations, why do you do this? Many of them don't actually talk about religion first. Often the first thing they talk about is their children or their grandchildren and their deep concern about the world that they're leaving to that next generation. And sometimes they talk about the places they love, the places that make this world feel like home. That's been part of my story because I grew up in a redwood canyon out in California. The redwood trees are older than the United States of America. They are older than the industrial revolution that is changing the climate around them. I used to I used to lay on a beanbag and look up through the skylight of my house and watch the movement of the trees above me. And after a while, you start to feel like maybe the trees are holding still and you're moving. Maybe the whole house is actually swaying back and forth in the wind. The thought that those redwood trees may within a couple of decades no longer be able to survive. Trees that are 500,000 years old, that they may no longer exist in 20 or 30 years because climate change has ruined the ecosystem that they evolved into, that they were perfectly adapted to, and that they need to continue their existence. That makes me so very sad because I feel like I would be homeless. The world that is my home, the world that looks the way I think it should look, the world I was born into won't exist anymore. So what people told me is they were concerned about the people and the places they loved. And because of that love, they figured out how to move beyond the fear and the paralysis, the sense of being overwhelmed and helpless in the face of problems as big as climate change, because we'll do anything to protect the people and places we love. We want our home to survive. And we want our children and grandchildren to have just as beautiful a home as we had. But people also said their faith motivated them because that message, that message many of them talked about in various forms, being called to be faithful, not successful, knowing that doing the right thing, even if it doesn't work out the way you think it should, you still did something that mattered because you lived your values. You lived the way your faith tradition thought you should live. And that had value, not only because it meant you were doing the right thing, but also because for most people of faith, there is a belief that we can only get so far and then there might be powers beyond us who can help make things turn out better than we mere mortals can make them turn out. People also said faith was vitally important to this work because it sustained them. It made it possible to keep going. It meant they knew that what they were doing mattered even if it didn't work. They also said to be part of an environmental organization is great. To go outside and learn about nature is great. But to take time 
to celebrate God's creation and to think about how wondrous it is, how awesome it is, how glorious it is, and the fact that we are part of it, to take those moments of celebration, that that was restorative and that that also helped them keep going because it wasn't just about them. It was about this big and beautiful, wondrous thing they were part of. So motivated by love and faith and sustained by faith and love, people were forming green teams, working together and turning their congregations into places where they were walking the talk and then sharing their stories so that other congregations and their communities could see what was going on and also be inspired and do similar things. And hoping that as more and more faith communities become involved in this type of activity, the public will change the way we think about what's going on with climate change. We'll say, hey, this isn't a political issue. This is a moral issue. This is a human issue. This is about living the way we're supposed to in right relationship with this beautiful planet we call home. And more and more of us will start to get involved and we'll actually build the beloved society, we'll build the kingdom of God, we'll heal the world and things will be the way we want them to be for our children and grandchildren. I think it's actually very important when forming a green team to take time to study your faith tradition, to ask yourself, what are the teachings that are central to me? What are the foundational teachings that will motivate me and sustain me in this work? I met a woman from a church in New Jersey the, this was also a Presbyterian church and they were going through a mission discernment period and thinking about what should be the emphases for their mission work going forward. The Presbyterian Church USA at that time was recommending environment as a mission area. And she said nobody on her committee actually thought that made sense. They'd for years done work on peace. They'd done work on poverty alleviation, and they understood those projects and thought they were very important. And environment seemed to come out of left field. They didn't really see why that one would matter, but they studied it because they wanted to look at the various ideas that the Presbyterian Church USA was recommending that year. And what Debbie O'Halloran told me was that the more they studied it, the more they realized all of the other issues that they'd worked on and that they cared about, poverty alleviation, peace and justice work, that those things could not actually be accomplished unless they also addressed the environmental factors that were causing those issues to get worse. Environmental factors were causing conflict. Environmental factors were threatening food supplies and causing people to lose their homes and their jobs and end up in poverty and become refugees. So finally, when it came time to decide what their mission focus should be, they unanimously voted to adopt environment as an area of mission for their congregation. I think any congregation, any faith community that really starts to study the connection between faith and environment would probably come to the same conclusion. But it's important to take the time to do that study so that you make that conclusion your own, not just something you got from somebody else. So if you're thinking about starting a green team, you might have a conversation and share your ideas and use these questions for reflection. What does your faith tradition say about the connection between faith and ecology? And what inspires you to take action? Are there foundational teachings in your scriptures or from your pastor that help you to take action even when you might feel a little hesitant? And finally, what practices or elements of your faith tradition sustain you through challenging times and tasks? Most of us do this kind of work on green teams as volunteers. We do it while also working to care for our families, working to put food on the table, 
doing other work in our churches, in our synagogues, in our mosques, in our temples, in our communities, to find the time to make the effort. You need practices that will sustain you and help you do this work, not just for a few weeks, but for years to come. Because the environmental issues we're dealing with, they aren't going to be solved in one year or in five years. This is actually a calling to a life's work that we'll be doing going forward. Thank you for joining me for this introduction to some of the reasons that people form a green team and take action in their congregations. Next month, we're going to have a follow-up session in which we'll be talking about what are some of the best practices for creating a green team? How do you get it going? How do you run it? Who should you invite to be part of it? How do you decide what to do? And we're gonna follow up in the following month with more discussion of things that you can actually do if you want to make your congregation a place that walks the talk, a place where earth care, care for creation is actually part of what you do in your faith community. Thank you. <laughs>